Welcome to the Talk Louder podcast, where we geek out on all things rock and roll. Hit that subscribe button on the YouTube channel. Leave your likes and comments. You can leave your likes and comments on our Facebook page and follow us on iTunes and Spotify. I'm Metal Dave Glessner, along with my co-host, Jason McMaster. And man, do we have a great show today. We are welcoming our very first guest on the Talk Louder podcast. And this guy is a friend of ours from back in the day. He's gone on to do some pretty great things. You guys might know him as the guitar player for Lita Ford. Um, He also has a band called Heaven Below. He was formerly in a band called Union Underground out of San Antonio. And uh, he's been gracious enough to to be our first guest. So we'll get into him in just a minute. We'll talk to him in just a minute. He's going to join us from L.A. But uh, Jason, I know you and Patrick have some history. Uh, Where did you guys first run into each other? Um, I played bass for Union Underground for two years. And that was uh, mid 90s, mid to late 90s. And uh, I was approached uh, my my Kiss tribute band that I had for many years called Sick um, played down in San Antonio. And um, to, un, unbeknownst to me, Patrick was in the audience and saw me play bass and uh, got my number from somewhere and called me and uh, wanted me to basically check out his band Union Underground. They needed a bass player. I said, sure, why not? So I checked it out. They came to, I had a toys gig in San Antonio. I, um, I think I stayed the night, uh, at Patrick's house. I think I remember playing video games and, you know, eating pizza and drinking soda pop, like 13 year old punks, uh, over at Pat's house. And then, uh, we went to their studio the next day and I jammed with them and I, yeah, I ended up playing bass for them uh, for two years, and um, you know we'll we'll get into that in the conversation with Pat. But uh, super fun guy, um, you know, it doesn't shock me that he's in Los Angeles and that he's done all this session work on records that people probably own that they don't realize he's the guitar player, um, and the fact that he's. Uh, playing in a band with a legend uh, in one Lita Ford, who was a member of the Runaways, who I don't need to say any more about that. Um, yeah, it's it's sick just to be able to say that you're someone you knew, you growing up in San Antonio with Pat in your scene and like all of that stuff. And now it's like here we are decades and decades later um having a podcast and having our buddy on the show who's completely worthy of rock star stats and dude he was at my wedding uh i was in a band with this guy for a bit you know sort of i was you know the help guy helping out until i had to go you know do get back to work on my own stuff you know um it's it's an important uh sort of like uh trophy for you and I to be able to say, that's our buddy, Pat, go Pat, go Pat. And, and he's going for it. He, you know, Union Underground, uh, did, did Ozfest. They toured with Marilyn Manson. They, they did well until their demise. And then, uh, Pat had to move to LA. Oh, poor Pat. Now he's, you know, now he's just got all kinds of shit going on. Yeah. Uh, hanging out with his idols and, and recording. And now he's, he's such a great singer, guitar player, and it's fantastic to have him on the podcast and, and especially have a buddy, our buddy, one of our buddies be, uh, be our first guest on talk louder. Yeah, absolutely. He's obviously accomplished a lot when you talked about him moving out to LA and you thought, Oh, poor Pat. Well, it could have been poor Pat, but his drive and his ambition is, is the reason he's still out there. And the reason he's been successful, because a lot of people go to LA to die. And, uh, and well, Pat- I know that he's, I know that he's been, you know, uh, an apartment manager, uh, a, a, a dog walker, Uh, and things like that to in order to survive you know the the sort of things that you would call i'm in between things right now so i have to do this in order to get my rock and roll on right so yeah everybody has that everybody does that and he's just real he's real but he's super high energy and you're gonna you're gonna be able to tell he's gonna make 
you'll see after you after you meet Pat here in a second, you'll see uh, you'll know what he makes me and Dave look like we're asleep. I think Dave said <laughs> earlier. So. Yeah, he does. He does. And uh, yeah, we're thrilled to have him as our first guest. So let's get into it with Mr. Patrick Kennison. <laughs> Our very first special guest star on the Talks Louder podcast. We've got Patrick Kennison joining us from his home base in Los Angeles. Woo-hoo. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, Pat. How are you, man? Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Pat is uh, living in L.A., but we know him from his days in San Antonio. He was one of us before he moved out to L.A. <laughs> and he's, he's still, still one, one of, of us. us. Yeah, he's still one of us. Yeah, yeah. So how are things out there? It's good. It kind of feels like stuff's starting to get back to normal um, from seeing tour dates on our calendar to the 405 looking like your I-35 once again with insane traffic. Um, that's your lifting your, mandates. That's your 35, just like it's our 35. That's true, but I don't know. I feel like, I feel like now I'm putting in time elsewhere. Yeah, you gave <laughs> it up. Yeah, you just traded it in for a, you put a, you put 405 in front of it now. I guess so. Sorry. I like, uh, I like high rent and, um, uh, and earthquakes. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned, uh, you, you mentioned, uh, touring, getting back on the calendar. You want to talk a little bit, uh, off the top here, what you've got lined up, what's on your calendar, where we can see you, what you're doing as far as, uh, tour dates and gigs and that sort of thing. Yeah. There's aw- awesome stuff on the horizon in July. We got M3. I've never played it. I'm sure Jason's probably played it. You've probably been to it, Dave. Uh, Lita will be back at M3 with a host of killer bands. Um, I'm seeing a lot of one-off weekend dates. I don't see our Alice Cooper tour that that COVID killed yet. I heard it's coming back. I haven't seen that on the calendar, but I do see a lot of dates, including a sunken garden theater date with the toys, with, uh, God, like old school bands. Cool. stars and legs diamond yeah i mean this sounds like a page out of 1988 you know what, angel was is angel on there too yeah i think they are i i know who that on. is yeah yeah and uh moxie too i believe yeah 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 that's a that's a joe anthony bill right there pretty much big time sunken mm-hmm. garden theater how many gigs have you been to at sunken garden theater pat in your oh man a whole lot i remember seeing lita ford uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s. Those are my early six. I remember Malmsteen, of course. I've seen the toys there with LA Guns. I remember Night Ranger. I remember Motley Crue playing to a tiny crowd, John Karabi. I have a million memories, including Union Underground playing a few times there. Yeah, yeah. For those who are listening uh, and aren't familiar, Sunken Gardens is uh, an outdoor amphitheater in San Antonio, Texas. And uh, I've spent many, 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 many nights there, as have the the other guys here, Pat and Jason. Uh, I've never performed on stage. Actually, I did perform on stage one time. I did. Who I had, brought you up on stage? At Sunken um, Gardens? Yeah, Brett oh, Michaels. Gosh. Brett Michaels brought me up on stage and I sang with poison in front of 3000 of my hometown friends. It was, I was probably there, but too drunk to know it was you. (laughs) The common denominators are mountainous here. Uh, You know, Lita was at, uh, Lita was by herself, I think, doing an acoustic thing when the toys played M3. Okay. That sounds right. Yeah. I was, I saw that she was on the bill and I'm on the elevator headed up to the stage and Lita's getting on the elevator and I'm looking around going, yeah, Lita, no big deal. Where's my bro Pat? Yeah. <laughs> and she was doing a solo acoustic thing and I was bumped. Oh man. Yeah. Her and I have been doing that. Not obviously not, I didn't do that one, but we do play uh acoustic duo stuff, which is, as you know, fun, but nerving sometimes. Of course. Yeah. yeah. You're, naked, you're naked. You don't have, uh, you know, just volume, but you know, ball behind you, you have more, uh, yeah. intimate feeling. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you've got, so you've got some stuff coming up with Lita. Um, what's the status on heaven below? You got any updates on that front? We have a San Antonio show. Uh, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. I don't think I'm supposed to. So a day or two before the sunken garden show, we're going to see, Heaven Below at Fitzgerald's in San Antonio a day or two before. Ah, 
we get an exclusive an exclusive announcement right here on the Talk Louder podcast, kids. I, I yeah. know. I ha- I'm probably saying it too soon, but it is. It looks like it's confirmed. So I'm well, excited. The- I figure if I'm going to San Antonio, got to make it count. Well, this this episode won't uh, be be you know available until it's actually closer. It's like this won't be up for another week or two. So you're okay. nice. Yeah, Perfect. you're you're fine. And even if you weren't. So what? <laughs> so what? <laughs> it's rock yeah. and roll. It's all about breaking the rules, right? That's right. Um, so I want to jump into some some history with Pat. Do um, it. Like um, like prior to 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 you and I even. I don't know. I really don't even know how far back uh, you and Dave go because I you know even though both of you guys are from San Antonio and and I might as well be. Um, yeah. The fact that. Uh, you had a band. I don't know if it would be your first band or not, but Boys in Heat, is that right? That was my second band ever, yeah. Well, tell <laughs> us a little bit about your, like, you know, you know, ten, age 10, 11, 12, and then getting your first guitar, and then your first band, second band. Just, you know, try to do that in a link, in a nice length. Yeah, uh, like a lot of people, I mean, San Antonio was called the heavy metal capital of the world. I remember hearing that on Joe Anthony when I was a little kid. I'm the youngest of seven kids, all my older brothers and sisters cranking Joe Anthony stuff. So, of course, it was only natural that I would end up doing this. Uh, uh, My brothers, we were all into Kiss, but I remember specifically seeing Looks That Kill on MTV for Motley Crue. Um, and I decided that was my kiss. Uh, and right around that time, I got a guitar uh, that I begged my mom for. And she was probably surprised as everyone else when I actually learned a lot of chords and could play songs all the way through. And, um, and then I met a, a drummer who was the same way. He could not only play the fill, uh, opening to Red Hot, he could play all the double bass and everything. His name was Chase. We had a band called Vengeance. And we won Battle of the Bands, and I won like best guitar player. It, it was it was like I'm sure a lot like you. you. The admiration is great, but you just wanted to sound like a record that you listened to, and yeah. people were surprised when you're playing stuff note for note. I don't know. That's all. I had to I had to work at it. It wasn't easy. I remember learning breaking the chains from Doc and Solo. It kicked my ass, and I, it was like the end of a video game. You're not going to get to the end of Mario Brothers or Twisted Metal and put the console down. You're going to finish that fucking game. So that was the same thing with the music. And um, I remember, you know, by the time that the 80s got rolling and it was late 80s and I was coming up on being almost 21, seeing toys and Universal uh, over there in Universal City and stuff. Then I had a band called Boys in Heat. And then we were like, now I knew other guys that could shred and, I don't know if the singer could sing, but he looked cool. <laughs> and then, you know, the 90s hit. Let's record ourselves. We got eight at. Oh, my God. We actually can make our shit sound a little bit like bands we like. We have some gear. And uh, that turned into Union Underground. I mean, you just keep discovering and digging and digging and, and playing, you know, playing an Ingve solo note for note isn't enough. You got to keep moving forward and write your own shit. And it's all a journey and a discovery, man. I'd, same reason why we're here talking today. Yeah, that's that's right. We we say that often, like, uh, oh, this and that and the other thing. That's the reason. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be sitting here nerding out on this shit. <laughs> Absolutely. Have, there's no reason to have a show if there's not not anything that we can geek out on. So yeah. so it sounds like your thing was was. Um, you know, excuse if I just say the trend, you know, everybody growing up in, uh, well, you know, we're all three of us. Uh, I'm from South Texas. I'm from Corpus Christi. In your story, it's the same. It's the same, same as mine. It's the same story as everybody else's story. Their journey may have been a little bit harder because they might have had to live on the streets while they were trying to figure it out. Uh, I can't imagine that. I'm so, I'm way too lucky. I can't imagine even yeah. doing it. Yeah, same thing here. Like, uh, you know, not even having to move out of your family home to get to get some ground, you know, is yeah. kind of luck. But that does happen. Um, 
you know, I think uh, I want to ask Dave, when was the first time that you saw Pat or met Fat, Pat or befriended Pat? Uh, like, was it at Sneakers? Now, the, the thing with Pat was uh, he went to a different high school than I did. And so okay. we weren't really high school buddies. And I wasn't real. I, I really didn't know him from the scene either until, uh, if I recall, and Pat, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I remember it was Boys in Heat was tr uh, getting back together to do a, a New Year's Eve gig at, at Sneakers. And it was sort of a reunion of sorts. And I think they'd been gone for a while. And uh, they were they were going to do this big New Year's Eve thing at the hottest club in town. And um, this guy, I, I'm going to, I, I want to say the guy's name was Dennis. Am I right, Pat? You are right. God rest his soul. Dennis yeah. Schultz. Dennis Schultz. Yeah. yeah. He approached me, I think, at Sneakers one night. And he was aware of who I was and knew I was a, a journalist, aspiring journalist or whatever. And he was tight with Pat and the Boys and Heat guys. And he said, you know, we're doing this reunion show and we're making it a big deal, blah, blah, blah. Would you be interested in writing up like a press release or whatever? And so I said, yeah, let, you know, wanted to get to know the guys. So I went to Pat's house and watched him rehearse. And uh, they were they were trying to come up with T-shirts and, and merchandise and stuff for this gig. And I ended up designing the T-shirt for the for the new Year, for the new year's eve reunion gig yeah and then i remember thinking okay i don't remember ever hearing these guys or anything about them but uh there was a video that they had done and this was back in the day you'll you, you can relate to this jason you, you you couldn't just do a video on your iphone i mean it took some budget and some know-how yeah. and some people with some skills and some resources yeah what year team, what what year i'm sorry to interrupt what year are we talking right yeah now? i was Tell us, Pat, when was that? It must be 90 or 91, because I was either still in high school or just got out of high school. That's, that's so the way that, right. Yeah, the way that you would have had to have edited that would have been some kind of a handheld eight millimeter kind of a camcorder, because those were super popular at the time. You could uh, replace the yacht, you know, as long as you had the footage and you had like, you know, take two kind of thing. The you sink, had a yeah. marker and sync, right. Yeah. Um, type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's that took a little time. It's not like just make a cool video and upload it an hour later. Well, once I once I saw the video and I went to rehearsal and I got to meet the guys and everything, I was like, wow, these guys are, you know, that's one thing about Patrick that I've always, you know, kind of admired and respected. It's like he always uh, strove for quality. And I was impressed with this band because I was hanging out with bands and guys that were in bands and doing gigs and everything. But I mean, the quality of this video, especially for the time, the fact that they were looking for, you know, trying to make merch, especially for this gig, it wasn't a long term deal. It was a reunion gig and it was going to be a one night blowout and they wanted merch and they had already done this video. They didn't do the video necessarily for the gig, but everything about them was really professional. And uh, I remember kind of hitting it off with the guys and I ended up designing the T-shirt. And then I went to the gig and the place was packed. And I was like, dude, <laughs> these guys are like the hometown heroes. And they were right under my nose the whole time. I, I think some of it was I was kind of hanging out with the thrash heads and the and the moshers and the, you know, <laughs> the death metal dudes and all that kind of thing. And some of it, too, was I probably, you know, when they were a big draw on the circuit, I probably might not have been old enough to get into the bars they were playing. That sounds right. Yeah. Cause yeah. we were under most of our, the band boys and heat were most of us were under age. I was going to say, cause I think you're younger than me, but because you're the band, you could get into these things. You could get into the gigs and play your, play your show. But I, as a spectator, didn't have an ID, wasn't old enough, that sort of thing. But anyway, that's kind of where Pat and I met. And okay. uh, yeah, it was the the old boys in the heat days. And I was impressed and we stayed in touch ever since. So just to round this, uh, round this up for people who might have just uh, caught this in the middle um, for whatever reason, we're talking to Pat Kennison, who currently plays for Lita Ford, has his own band called Heaven Below that is actually from Texas and from our stomping grounds, which is... One of the reasons I will proudly say once again that uh, it's really, really good to have a homeboy as our first guest on Talk Louder. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. We all have some history together and uh, we've been waiting to have a, a special guest and we thought who better than one of our hometown guys that's uh, got some stories to tell and has some history with us and uh, and has, uh, you know, attained a certain level of success. I'll go ahead and say it. I'm, I'm yeah, pretty, of course. Pretty so, proud of some of the things you've done, man. And thank you. That, thank you. Guys. And without <clears throat> without this episode being like seven hours long. We will try to uh, incorporate as many of the cool bro down stories that we actually have and the intertwinings uh, and connections that the three of us actually do have. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, just to run, run down, this is out of order. Uh, you were at my wedding. I was thinking of that. I was thinking of that today. Yeah, that was, there's, what year there's, was that? Uh, that's uh, 2012. Wow. God, yeah. time's flying, man. That feels yeah. like that feels like yesterday. Yeah, yeah. And then so we can and we can talk a little bit more about that. Um we we also uh you know, I mean, uh, not to toot my own horn, but I was we were I was in your band. I was thinking of that. That was awesome, too. And I think that you guys came to a toys gig to uh <laughs> it was hilarious because I didn't know you. I didn't know you. Right? Yeah. And I did. I, I I thought that you and Brian looked familiar or something, but I yeah. I didn't know you guys. Yeah. And um, you guys, I think, came to a toys gig in like '96 or '90 something like that. And you, you, you we had already planned it out that I was going to audition for for Union Underground on bass. Yeah. And I remember something that you said that always stuck with me. And there are many things that stuck with me because you're just funny as hell i think <laughs> and uh you're a natural entertainer and and it was like i was kind of you know sheepishly you know easing my way into the union underground's uh circle right by yeah. and and i remember you you saying yeah tomorrow is operation woo <laughs> <laughs> You were looking at me telling you tomorrow's Operation Woo, so you can because you're gonna woo us with your playing, right? Right, that's what that, that I had to think twice about. That I was like, <laughs> that still just sounds really odd, but then I got to know you, and it's like, no, that's not odd, that's Pat <laughs> Operation Woo. Well, because I had seen you play bass with your Kiss tribute band, and that's, that's what right. I took to the rest of the guys. I said, You think of Jason as this badass singer, you should hear him play bass because I saw sick play and i was like this guy's a badass bass player well yeah make, you know fake it till you make it right <laughs> i'm still so, doing that yes yeah, so i know right well you've done a great job okay so tell us uh tell us about union underground and really what ended up being the stepping stone as to how union underground sort of filtered into because you, dude you guys played Ozfest. You became friendly with a lot of the bands of the era. Uh, totally what year was the Ozfest that you were on? That was two thousand one. Okay, so tell us about you know how you're in San Antonio. You're getting your 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 show together, and I mean literally the show because you guys had screens and you has you guys had lighting. Yep. And you guys really really um, put on a, some kind of spectacular show back then it was you guys were all about it you were all about production again again if i may interject this goes right back to what i was talking about even back to the club days with boys in heat so you know there was always this level of professionalism this level of larger than life uh production and and an appreciation for giving the crowd uh, a show yeah so pop, go- pops and pops and whistles and what's a what's a circus without clowns and lions Exactly. We had started recording ourselves. We had the ADATs. We, uh, the singer and I had gone to school to do audio engineering. So we were starting to learn what comb filtering was. What is parallel compression? Why does the snare at the beginning of Dr. Feelgood sound so ginormous? Oh, well, they sampled it. And then Tommy Lee played, you know, we're learning all this stuff. Then we started applying some of what we knew and learned into our 24 track studio that we had built and borrowed our college money for, I never went to college, but borrowed college money from that our parents were gonna give us and made a studio. So then it just seemed obvious to me, okay, now the snare is starting to sound like 
a Motley Crue album. Now the kick drum. And of course, we're always trying to write songs along the way. The song has to be good. The uh, riff alone is nothing until everything goes. All those things we do. And then we thought, okay, people are going to come see us if we hand out tapes that sound good. They can't show up and it look like somebody's bad bar mitzvah. It better kind of look like Pantera or Motley Crue's going to play. You know, we actually would say, what do we look like on stage? You know, we'd film us and, you know, I, I, somehow I transitioned from the guy that looks like Mark Slaughter to the guy that looks like Nikki Six. I, I was, you know, maybe it was, maybe it was planned. I was just like, okay, I want to look like a rock star, but I, I, I can, I want to be able to play solos. So we just, we film ourselves and stuff. And ultimately, record labels started paying attention to us because we got a review in a music connection magazine. And um, my buddy, John Grell, our buddy who worked there said, you're getting a review in music connection, but they really are harsh on everybody. So please don't be mad at me when the review goes south. And I thought, well, okay, fine. Yeah, the review was that. awesome. Yeah, you can't expect it to be great just because you're licking stamps and sending out stuff. Do you remember what songs you sent them? Yep, it was bitter. We didn't have Turn Me On, Mr. Dead Man yet. I think oh, we wow. had... That's, that's early. That's early. We had maybe Bleeding Mary was another song and probably a couple songs that, that didn't make it to the major label album, but they had good production because we really tried to make it sound like something that you would go buy at Hastings Records. And when that review came out good, there were still a lot of labels and people in the industry were calling our studio phone. So not to go backwards, but I've got, um, turn me on Mr. Dead man, South Texas death ride, the friend song. And these are, uh, you've got the dirty version and the clean version. Yep. Okay. Uh, then you've got, I've got the, the, the label, this, this, uh, this is a promo. This is a radio promo and yep. this is the album. So yeah. the album, you know, those songs are on here. Uh, bitter. The songs that you're talking about are on here. It seems yeah. to be a natural high. The reason I even have, I have a connection to, uh, you know, at least a third of this record. I was playing bass on these songs with yep. you. Yeah, I remember. So it's that early. So so you're getting uh, you're getting attention. Um, the phone's ringing. You, I did a. Um, a showcase with you guys in, in Los Angeles. Yep, that's how right. Did, that was how for did, how did uh, that? the it's guy. Not, it's not about me, but it's you guys found a manager, a guy who, want, guy who wanted to manage you, and he helped you set that up, right? Yep, that label was RCA, and the guy who signed No Doubt and Dave Matthews, his name was Brian something or other, he came to see us, and he thought we had something, but then he let us down a few layers and uh, days later and said, I I, I'm not ready to do it, but you have something going on for sure. Yeah, well, you know, that led to another. I just remember flying yeah. in and flying out the same day just so, you know, we could make that happen. I remember it was a killer showcase. I felt like we played right. We had a lot of energy and not in an ego way. I said, okay, I feel like we nailed it. That felt like a show as much as it can with just playing for a group of industry people. Right. I thought in my head, we got a record deal. I know we did. We didn't. That day we didn't. Right. Right. Well, it can't always it can't always work out that way. I remember I remember the 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 showcase very, very well. Yeah. Uh I just used whatever rig they had because I'm mm -hmm. coming from the airport. Uh, yeah. I may have had a couple of my pedals with me, but not much. I took the minimal. Yeah. And I remember on our last song, you, you, and I, we, I had played a bunch of shows with you guys and yeah. I've never seen you go, go for it. Like I yeah. said, go for it there. You like got on the floor on your back and like rolled. You did the, Angus I did my Angus young. I did the Angus young. That's yeah. Did. Cur you did the curly shuffle. You got on. The I did. <laughs> it was the friend song and the solo was so crazy and noisy. Yeah. I was just like, yeah. I'm going to just, I can't jump into the crowd like I normally would. So I'll just no, jump in the middle of the stage. There was no crowd. It was like a, there were like folding chairs. And <laughs> it, was like a, it was like a recital room because it's not really a stage. We were just set up fate, you know, on the floor. Even it was a, even. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. That's cool. What year was that? That must have been 97, 
97, 98 at the latest. I think that you're right. That yeah. might have been the last thing I did with you guys. Okay, so yeah. uh, turning turning this into you needing a bass player, needed a bass player. You were playing in like five bands. You had like you flew in, and then I think you went home and did another gig. Maybe that same night, knowing you. Yeah, yeah. he's still <laughs> in next five day. bands. Yeah, I'm still in <laughs> 1,000 bands. It's terrible. It's an <laughs> addiction. Um, I remember telling you, uh, you and Brian were like, well, who can we get that you're, you're, you got, you know, you, you write your own songs. You want to go do your own thing, of course. Well, yeah. who can we get that, you know, plays with pedals and plays with a pick and yeah. looks cool? And I said, John Moyer. Was, was it you that turned us on to John Moyer? Of course, it another was. Austin guy. Yeah, yeah. I, I, y'all were like, who can we get? And I go, he's in Soak. He, they're, yeah. they're playing at uh, La Zona Rosa. And, and we did guys, the same thing to him that we did to you. We we got in on him. <laughs> it's called Operation Woo. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so you went to La Zona Rosa and handed him one of these, and you went, hey, dude, learn these songs and come jam with us. And I, I, he did. And, and next thing you yep. know, you had a deal and you're on the road and Ozfest, And yep. ultimately that's how he had met the guys in disturbed. That's right. I helped facilitate the meeting of, of, uh, Moyer and disturbed because I knew that fuzz was gone. Union underground was done. So I said, I have your guy. They said, who is it? I said, it's John Moyer. They said, what about union underground? I said, that's over as far as I'm concerned. And so I helped get John over there and it happened. Well, the story with that, not to have this be about John, because I, I think it would be great to have John on the show as well. Oh, but, hell yeah. But not to make it be about th just that part of it, because we got a lot of stuff to talk about. But I'm mm -hmm. telling you, he told he the way he tells the story is awesome. And I know that him getting an audition and you facilitating that is a beautiful thing. But he tells the story that he stood in line with like, I don't know, a hundred other bass players. He did. When when he could have called them, and and I believe the guys in Disturbed told like Dave and them told said, dude, you could have just called us. You would have saved us doing this for three days, <laughs> three day auditions with a hundred bass players. He was showing them that he didn't expect anything, the same that's, way I try to live my life. That's exactly right. And that tells you what kind of person John is. So yeah. yep. Yeah, John. hats off to that. That's just kick ass. Standing in in the hot sun in Chicago all day long with a hundred bass players who were going blah, 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 blah. right. Yeah. It's standing exactly. in a line. Right, right. Yep. John so, told, told me that story as well. Yeah. Yeah. I I wanted to ask, uh, you know, obviously you've done uh, a lot of a lot of really cool things and a lot of accomplishments uh, to your credit, but I've always been impressed with the fact that Union Underground went out as the opening act with Marilyn Manson. You did a tour with Manson, and not not just that you did a tour with Manson. You probably did a tour with him at the peak of his, uh, you know, popularity. So that was a huge ticket and a huge tour for you guys to land the opening slot. So one, how did you land the opening slot? And then two, how long did the tour go on? And uh, what can you tell us about, uh, you know, Manson and his band? And, you know, I, I know there was some shenanigans. Tell as little or as much as you'd like. I remember getting the word from management that Manson chose us to be on the tour. And I said, listen, guys, I don't believe in Santa Claus. You don't have to sugarcoat anything. Who from the label, who from management made this happen? And they said, no, really, he really did. And so I, even on the first day of tour, I was sure that, that the in, somebody in the industry did it. I was wrong. I told the band the first night when we were setting up for soundcheck, I said, watch, we're not going to see Manson until the end of the tour. He's never going to come and say hi to us or anything. I was just sure of it because, you know, eight labels had already told us no before we finally got Columbia to do it. Why would this be any different? Boy, was I wrong. That day, uh, 10 minutes before we go on, there's a knock on the door. It's Twiggy in full regalia. It's Manson behind him. <laughs> they walk in. My heart, my heart's pounding, but I got to be cool because I look like some guy that's in some badass new metal band. So I bring him in and I go, oh, guys, look who's here to see us. And Manson goes into the story about hearing Turn Me On, Mr. Dead Man on the radio and wanting to know who the band was. And I was like, Fuck, it's good to be wrong. 
Thank you. I'm <laughs> thanking. I'm thanking my grandma who always, you know, gave me so much confidence and strength. I'm like, who had passed. I'm like, Nana is making sure that everything in my life is awesome. You know, I'm thinking that in my head. So uh, he had discovered the band and thought we were amazing. Just hearing the song, you know. So yeah. And uh, as we became friends with Twiggy and Manson. We did things that will probably be saved for a book by somebody at some point one day, not me, maybe Moyer, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but it was surreal, man. It was really surreal. Uh, but but it, it made us step our game up too. Like this dude coming out here with these props and this stuff, John Five on guitar, you know, it's what planet is this and why is my sneakers ass doing this you know from san antonio you know my macarthur high school ass doing so, this you so ask if, yourself that and then you figure it out so if you have the sneakers ass i have the back room ass the back room ass yeah. <laughs> well, i have i have the sneakers ass too though yeah right? yeah uh, how long did that tour go on it was it was a couple months. Yeah, was a it was a hazy time because we were in our twenties, and I didn't. I knew I tried some drugs. I always thought cocaine was a crappy drug. I found out with by touring with Manson. No, there's good cocaine and bad cocaine. I found that out. I had never known that. Um, and for whatever reason, my the way I am personally, I've tried shit. You know, I just have the Catholic guilt. I can't, I can't wake up and bust out some lines. I can't even wake and bake. Uh, I can't even wake and drink. But I did partake in some of that, and we'll have to save that for a book or something one day. <laughs> well, well if you, you know, the, the yeah. things that the things that you do that make you do other stupid things. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's what you mean by book worthy, right? So, yeah. So kids don't do some of the things that you're probably going to end up doing. Right. Because you'll, they'll lead to other things that, you know, will make you have to write a book about it. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta check yourself before you wreck yourself. That's right. <laughs> and you usually can't put the book out until all your parents and grandparents are gone to heaven. Yes, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> Oh, look, I just bought my grandson's book. And then they read it and have a heart attack and die. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that is <laughs> true. <laughs> Here's another one I wanted to ask. Uh, the drummer in the Lita Ford band is Bobby Rock, who uh, spent some time uh, with the Vinnie Vincent invasion. What's the best Vinnie Vincent story you've heard from Bobby Rock? Oh, he's told me some great ones. The one I want to tell, I can't say on your show. Um, that one's a book one. <laughs> Oh man. Um, well, he, Bobby is such a good person. He doesn't throw people under the bus. Um, but he did overall let me know that Vinny is kind of an eclectic personality that apparently is Bobby didn't say this, but I took this from what he said, uh, might be difficult for some people to work with. And when he talked about making records with Vinny and how things transpired in the studio and the, and the, Oh, kick drum number five in bar two, uh, is a little bit flaming with the kick drum that I programmed. So you need to make that kick drum, right? I mean, stuff like that, that's in Bobby's book. You, you can easily see why Gene and Paul had a problem with Vinny Vincent. No question. You're not going to tell Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley how the cow eats the cabbage. Apparently, Vinnie Vincent did. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think I think Vinny, uh, just to fanboy out for a second, I think Vinny was in was in Kiss in a in a decent at a decent hour. Oh, yeah. yeah, and he on, he brought some of the greatest songs on yeah. the clock, you know, on on yeah. the Kiss clock during you know yeah. during the the you know he, the at the in the last moment of the when Kiss was the bad the the biggest band the hottest band in the world, yeah, uh, Vinny was in the band, yeah, and, and his talent brought him there. I guess I don't know. It comes down to a personal personality, I guess. I guess if you help your the gods of music at a time that they need it, does that entitlement turn into a divisive situation? 
from the outside, I can imagine, but I wasn't, none of us were there. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I say always stay humble. And when the light's on you, kick as much ass and go wild. Yeah, I think that when you're up, when you're up for any kind of review, it's important to, to re- try to remember to stay humble, especially when you're um, in a room with the boss. I, I, I don't tell Lita how the cow eats the cabbage. I don't need to. She, no. I learn stuff from her every day. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you, 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 you don't get um, this has nothing to do with Lita, by the way, yeah. but you don't get yeah. old being dumb. Exactly. Yeah, that's why we're still talking about Kiss. Exactly. That's right. Yeah, I yeah. stole that from Richard Pryor. <laughs> yeah. Don't get old being dumb. So. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe maybe Vinnie Vincent challenged. Uh, well, I read Paul's book. It sounds like Vinnie challenged some people when he might maybe shouldn't have. Yeah. Uh-huh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So you bring up uh, an interesting point, uh, how important the chemistry is in a band among the personalities. Forget the talent. You know, the talent has to be there. We understand that. But you're about to live with these people on the road and travel and all this stuff. Uh, In the Lita Ford band, how would you characterize each band member? You know, if you could if you could sum up their personality in one or two names, go go through the band and tell us who's who's what. I can tell you some great stuff and you'll see why she's kept this lineup for a long time. First thing, many things blow me away about Lita. Uh, When we're on a tour bus, Lita Ford does not command the back of the bus or the front of the bus and call it her area. Lita Ford takes the bottom bunk and has her dogs across from her on the bottom bunk and treats you like a guest in a house and makes you feel so at home. That blew me away out of many things with her. Um, Lita Ford has a punk rock side to her. Uh, I, 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 what were, what, what would I say? A biker punk rock attitude. And that is awesome. She's not someone that bitches about first being in first class or, you know, taking the biggest dressing room. Um, so that immediately works well with me right away. I'm like, Oh my God, it's like my big sister out there. Um, Bobby rock is a health nut and he's so aware of the, musical temperature at any situation at sound check or anywhere i don't even know if i'd use the word humble he's like uh he's like a monk he's relaxed he doesn't get loud and when he checks his drums it's the loudest fucking person hitting a drum i've ever heard it's scary um it's as if he holds any uh, energies and they come out in his performance and so I couldn't ask for a better drummer to play with. Uh, and Marty O'Brien uh, comes from my school, uh, the new metal school. Um, Got to be able to play any notes that are thrown at you, any passages, any weird time signatures. And then when it's time to get off stage and chill with people and, and talk about food or talk about tacos and San Antonio, he's your man. Uh, so I think that's why the chemistry with this current lineup of Lita Ford works so well. Uh, we even do a little prayer huddle before we get on stage that Bobby leads. It's like I said, once again, like a monk thing saying, okay, everybody clear your mind, things like this. It doesn't matter what kind of travel accommodations we had. doesn't matter what happened. These people came here because they want their ass kicked for the next hour. And he always says stuff that works on me. I'm thinking about, oh, I didn't get first class on this flight. You know, I'm, I'm an idiot in my head. And I'm thinking, of, oh, well, I don't have the guitar that Norm. No, that doesn't matter. These people came to get their ass kicked. Yeah. So that's why that chemistry with Lita Ford Band works so well. So I think that's important to a band that uh, it, longevity helped clear the mind. I think that's really good. It wouldn't work in every band situation, though. You're right. For Lita Ford and her legacy, it seems to feel like the right thing to do. Maybe because she she had had made the path for so many decades. And it's like, Bobby doesn't say this, but I feel like this. I feel like when I get on stage with Lita, I cannot disappoint that person that remembers the falling in in and out of love video from Headbangers Ball. I can't disappoint that person. And that's how I, that's how I feel. It doesn't mean I act like an old guitar player she had. It means I, I give justice and vibe to everything about that song. 
which, by the way, I will take the credit for bringing that song back into the set when I joined her band. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Speaking of her set, uh, she can't do a show without playing Close My Eyes Forever. And you, of course, sing the Ozzy Osbourne portion of that song. Um, tell me uh, how it came about. How did she approach you about, you know, if, if you'd be willing to do it? Um, and then what were your, you know, what was your homework at that point? Just, just tell me how that all came about. I'm going to give you two for one answer. So the guy that got me the audition that put it all together was Bill Xavier, the president of BC Rich Guitars. I made friends with him back in Union Underground days when I played those guitars. And uh, he worked at another company. Uh, he's a killer guitar player himself, took lessons from Satriani. When I met him, when he worked for PV, we jammed together for hours at PV. And he, at the end of the day, he goes, hey, bro, I wanted to say how honored I am that you came in here to jam with me and you're in this band that's blowing up. And I, I didn't care. I was just like, this guy can play that ass, so I want to play with him. He went on to be years later to become the president of BC Rich Guitars, and he called me up and said, Lita is looking for a guitar player. You're not only a perfect guitar player with your singing, I'll bet you'll end up singing the Ozzy Osbourne part. And we laughed about it. Oh, that's a good, that's funny. That'd be hilarious. <laughs> it's exactly what happened. He was right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I, I go for the audition, I get the gig, and then Lita and I have to do these acoustic shows, and she wants to have me back her up. You know, uh, she liked my singing. She was always said she was blown away that I knew all the harmonies to every song. Uh, and she said, Why don't you sing Close My Eyes Forever? And I'm like, Oh my God. So, dude, so that, I, that, that means that you were wrong twice. I was wrong twice. Yeah. Wrong about the Manson thing, and you were wrong about the Aussie parts. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And he, and he, and he did it. It's good to be wrong. Yeah. Dude, yeah. It's, and, and when somebody tells you to sing an Aussie part, um, once again, I don't want to disappoint that guy in the back of the venue that has never been to Alita Ford show, but he loves Close My Eyes Forever. I cannot disappoint that guy back there. And so that's the attitude I take with it. I don't, I don't make it my own per se. I don't try to sound too much like Ozzy. I just try to just get that energy out there and, and do my thing. And um, I just try to do it justice, you know? I want to jump in here and talk about Lita just for a second. I, I uh, you know, if, if Lita's watching this or listening to this, I don't want her to take this wrong. And she's probably just super mellow, and I can only imagine that she's just super cool, big sister kind of kind of thing. But she's a fucking legend. Oh yeah, she's a, she is like she gave hope where there was none for young women and girls uh, in a in a you know in an industry that's dominated by male in the seventies. Yep, and I was, see it every night. Yeah, yeah, and was probably pulled into some sticky situations that were not healthy whatsoever in any form or fashion. And she probably had to learn the hard way about how what's what's you know how am I going to pull this off without fucking it up for my my future in this industry because. Yep. I'm a lifer. I drank the punch. I'm doing this. This is it. I'm in a band called the runaways. We're just kids. We're writing songs with the guy who wrote songs with the biggest band in the world kiss. And that's yep. one And Kim Fowley. Yep. This is crazy time. So back to her, you know, when she, you know, in the eighties, when she did her solo career, honestly, I was not the biggest fan. I'd rather hear, her, you know, cherry bomb a million more times you know i'm just i wasn't the biggest like lita fan but yeah. i'm telling you like i think that there's a a cheese factor to you know kiss me deadly and sure. i think that the i think that the close your eyes forever think i think that that song and the way it's written was creepy enough for me to go this is really almost like you know, it's like it has an ethereal vibe to the yeah. song, you know? and it's not necessarily a power ballad. It's not really like a power ballad to me. Yeah, it's um, dark. It's arguable. Yeah, it's dark, dark enough for me to yeah. see, hear it and go, I don't know, that's pretty cool. And it's and it's yeah. appropriate that she got Ozzy Osbourne to do the call and answer. 
Yeah. Now that's my, that's my say. I hope Lita doesn't put a hit out of my head. So <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the thing, uh, I, I just think that the, your work ethic and, you know, even back when I was working with you in the union underground, I remember you singing a little bit, but dude, as years went by and I heard just like cover versions of shit that you've done, you've turned into such a kick fucking ass singer and front man in heaven. Well, I have friends oh. like you. What am I going to do? What, when you're friends with you, something's going to happen. <laughs> well, I, 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 I'll, I'll take that as a compliment, but it, you know, you did all of that on your own. Um, you know, I'm not, uh, whatever your influence was, it's your ethic and it's what you want. And you know what you want to sound like and sing like and play like, because you're a fan before anything else. Oh yeah. 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 I was going to ask earlier because uh, you're, you're obviously known for your guitar playing and, and you've uh, been extremely dedicated to, to, to your craft on guitar, but I too have sort of seen your vocals come along in, in more recent years, when I first met you, you were already a killer guitar player and just got more killer. And I never really thought of you much as a singer because you weren't necessarily the front man in the bands that I, you know, the uh, Boys in Heat and and uh, and even in Lita Ford. Uh, so at what point did you start fe either feeling the need to work on your vocals? And, and at what point did you catch up to your guitar? Because I feel like the vocal thing came along a little bit later, but uh, you've caught up. And so tell us about that, that, that time frame. I was always the guy in all my bands that would, would sing the backing vocals. I, I, I'm a little bit of a dork with like music theory. I know what a flat five is. I know what diminished is. I know what a third, a fourth, all that stuff. And so I was always the guy where the singer would say, can you do the high harmony? And then of course his grunge stuff got grungier. People say, can you do the harmony underneath? Um, Specifically, Alice in Chains' Dirt came out, and Jerry Kent, I didn't even know his name was Jerry Kent all the time. Uh, harmonies everywhere from the guitar player, weird intervals on the song Junk Man, weird, cool backing vocals on Hate to Feel. I was like, oh my God, I admire everything I'm hearing about this. And it was a new level. It, it, it went from the 80s backing vocals, the shout backing to weird harmonies. And I just said, I'm in. That's I want to be as good as that is on dirt. And I kind of carried it into everything I did from Union Underground demos singing on that. And then honestly, without being negative, when Union Underground was not the next Motley Crue or the next Pantera, it was painful for me. It was hard in my relationship with my singer of that band had gotten so strained and bad and the band ended for me. I, I thought either I can kill myself or kill other people, or I can take that energy and just put it into what I'm ch already been chasing after, which for me was more songs and vocals. And that's what I did. Yeah. 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 I, you went to, you, you put yourself in vocal training. Absolutely. Yeah, Especially started, with acoustic stuff. You started coaching yourself and that was your therapy out of a, of a sticky situation. Absolutely. My mother, my mother was definitely somebody that helped me after the union underground thing ended because it was, it, we got it. We had a lot of breaks, a lot of great things. And when it ended, my mom said, look, you need to not worry about other people. You need to forgive, not for them, but for you. And you just need to do what you want to do. She's right. And, I, and, and she was right. And my mom was my therapist. And I just stayed with more vocals and more songs and guitar. And that was it. That's how I dealt with it. You know, I knew that turning to drugs would, I, I already know, I already knew where that went. That's cliche and boring. So I just kept on with it. Yeah. 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 Mom knows best, right? Moms know. She raised seven kids, boy. She knew yeah. what to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I wanted to mention that uh, today has uh, been, been sort of a day of coincidence for me. Um, I was upstairs uh, before this interview playing some music with my son, and I, I plunk around on an acoustic guitar, and I'm terrible. But I have, uh, I have a bunch of picks laying around in my guitar case, and as I'm fumbling around, not looking for one in particular, I pull up this. Whoa! 
It is an official Patrick Kennison Lita Ford guitar pick. And I thought, I guess I, I must have scored this somewhere along the way or you gave it to me or whatever. But I thought, what a coincidence, because we're going to have Pat on the show today. And then yes. just before I came downstairs to do this, I got a text from Johnny Martin. And nice. I, I told Johnny, I said, hey, man, uh, we probably need to get you on the podcast at some point. But uh, Patrick Kennison is our, fir- is our very first guest on the, on the podcast today. And he said, make sure you, t- you profess my undying love to Patrick on the podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, so, yeah, it, it is b- coming from here, too. We love Johnny. I love the L.A. Guns guys. Great people always feel welcome around them every time I, I see them. I, it's in one of those moments again, you know, for, first I make friends with the badass dude from Dangerous Toys. Now I'm friends with the guys from LA Guns. You know, I have a, a, a guitar that Robin Zander gave me, a bass from Nikki C- I mean, what planet is this and why am I getting all this? <laughs> Well, you're, John, you're, one, you're one of those guys that's kind of everyone's buddy, Pat. That's it's you're easy to get along with. You and can see why. Y- yeah, you yeah. everybody who's going to hear you just talk on the podcast or or watch uh, the YouTube version of Talk Louder of this episode, they're going to they're going to. Well, this, this guy, I want to meet this guy. This if I'm having a bad day, I just need to go to Pat's house. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, pretty much right. So I, that none of none of that surprises me at all. Um, and and you know, your so your Union Underground kind of like fizzles, and you're standing there. When when and what was the last straw that made you pack up and go to L.A.? I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but the problem with bands is there's industry people, managers, and things that are that make situations divisive. They facilitate divisive things. And the label uh, let 75 artists on Sony were off their roster and that included us. But more importantly, my band was falling apart. Um, And I didn't feel like the fruits were not being made, however you would say it. And I was at a crossroads personally. Um, I didn't want to stay in San Antonio, and I'd made friends in L.A. One of those friends was Scott Humphrey, super producer that's done all the Rob Zombie and the Tommy Lee and a Motley Crue record. He produced the the, the ill-fated Union Underground album that wasn't finished or didn't happen. And um, when things were going really bad with Union Underground, I was at my wit's end. Uh, There was money things that were bad. He said, hey, do you want to come play on a Rob Zombie album? I'm like, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> and um, he said, well, he said, uh, he, he, I got along with him just like I do with you guys. And he said, well, I think you're a great player. It could easily end up that you play guitar in Rob Zombie. I'm like, well, okay. Um, so I go to his badass studio where we'd recorded. Zombie comes over. They show me the song. I lay the tracks. It feels really good, man. And once again, I'm thanking my grandma and whoever is in charge of what happens in this universe. Uh, and uh, the song gets put on a, a, a greatest hits album of Rob Zombies. And I find out that this guitar player who's okay, I guess, named John Five ends up playing with Rob Zombie. And of course, I'm not mad at all. Of course, he got John Five. If he had got somebody that that I didn't think was up to standard, I'd be pissed. But when he got somebody badass, I was happy about it. Now I'm like, I got to play on a Rob Zombie thing. Great. And um, that kind of told me, maybe I just need to stay in LA. It's It needs to just, I got to find out what's going to happen here. I, I don't want to be in San Antonio at the bar talking to my buddy about OzFest and about the time I did Coke with Marilyn Manson sounds lame i don't want to talk about yesteryear um the whole union underground experience was like just you know you can put the you can put it in a little bit but you can't stay in for very long oh but it feels so good oh no you can't stay in very long i need you to pull it out now it was the ultimate tease for me and i was like uh, no 
I'm not doing that. I, I, I got, I got the tip in, and now I want to get all of it in all the way. And that's not going to happen in San Antonio. That's how, that's how I thought. <laughs> how long have you been in LA now? 2003. That's when I, I did that thing with Zombie. 2002, and then yeah, I moved out here in 2003. Okay. Yeah, you've been out there for a while. Yeah. So um, I know that uh, I, I know that your very first concert was Iron Maiden Power Slave and the opening act was Wasp. Life-changing. Uh, tell me why. That's where I was going. Why was that life-changing? Well, my mom wasn't letting me go to concerts uh, at first when I was 10 and 11 because she knew that everyone smoked weed because I had six older brothers and sisters. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to go. So finally, I turned 12 or 13, whatever it was. It was so either was 12 or 13. Enough. 12 or 13 was old enough for you to smoke weed. <laughs> was all I get, she didn't say that, but she let my brother take me. And I had um, the Power Slave album, loved it. Loved the album so much. Uh, my brother loved the Paul Diano stuff. I was into the Bruce stuff. And then once again, kind of like the way Looks That Kill played late night on MTV, I saw I Want to Be Somebody. Another one of these moments where, oh my God, this is like my kiss again or whatever. Um, and I remember getting, my mom got me the, the first Wasp album. I had to sneak fuck like a beast and get it without my mom's knowledge because she would have drawn the line on it saying fuck like a beast with the, with the cod piece. So that one I hid from her. But she did buy me the, the first album that was sold in stores. And I love the video for I Want to Be Somebody. And then when my brother said, uh, we're going to the concert, I'm like, that it sounds like another planet. Sure enough, I went, man. And, you know, I wasn't drinking yet or doing anything. And I remember Wasp opening the set with On Your Knees and them coming out and Chris Holmes, this big old weird dude, like biker dude banging on his guitar. And there was smoke and it was so loud. I'd only heard a few live bands in front of me at that point, And they were just local ones or a friend's band, uh, my brother would make jokes. He goes, you didn't talk the entire show and your face looked like it was frozen. And look, and I always thought he was making fun of me. It's, I was just so couldn't believe that that was happening. They, I was in the same room as Wasp and then Iron Maiden opened their set with Aces High and this Eddie can't, uh, it was, it was uh, speechless. So I'm going to jump in here. This this is a moment on Talk Louder where everyone in this room right here has literally said almost the exact same thing or been compared to a similar situation, first concerts, standing there completely in focus, almost shedding tears, or in my case, shedding tears <laughs> at your first concert because it really kind of set up biblically uh, – what you wanted to do with your life, uh, not Absolutely. to go twisted sister on you. I want to rock because <laughs> yeah. it's true. It's true. I was, I tried sports. I was awful. I played basketball. It was embarrassing. Uh, I was well, told sports, I'd throw like sports, a girl, sports, you know, I, couldn't, I, I didn't do the theater thing. This was everything. Yeah, I, sports, I think I might be able to do that. Sports are, are, are how you bond with your parents until your older brothers tell you about rock and roll. Exactly. I love that. Exactly. <laughs> well, I, I was like, hey, bada bada, huh? I missed. Who cares? Where's a bass? Give me a guitar. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. I, I was at that same gig and I remember uh, it wasn't my first concert, but it was one of the early ones. And uh, the pairing of Wasp and Iron Maiden, especially at that time, you got uh, Maiden on the Power Slave tour and Wasp, I believe, was Last Command at that point. No, it was still the first album. Was it still the first one? It was wow, still the first album. It was Stephen early. Riley was on drums. See, that's even oh, better. I mean, so yeah, I, I remember being blown away, too. And I had been to a couple of arena shows at that point. But, you know, the spectacle of Maiden and Wasp just was like eye-popping, ear-blowing the whole deal. You know, it was it was awesome. Great. You show. know, the problem with that concert was for me? I thought all concerts were going to be like that. <laughs> yeah. That That's another story. After Blackie drinks blood from a skull and Eddie came out more than once, yeah. other concerts were different. I had to accept that fact. Yeah. Right. I, I, uh, 
I I remember I did an interview one time with Kirk Hammett. You just uh, this reminds me of something he said. He was like, uh, the first time I saw Kiss on TV, my mind was blown, and I figured all bands were like that. This is what I want to do. This is rock and roll. Oh my god! And then he saw Peter Frampton on TV, and he went, oh, Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and, exactly. no disres- and no disrespect to Peter Frampton. I'm a yeah. fan and I respect him, but his point was exactly yours. It's like if you get spoiled right out of the gate with this eye popping spectacle, yeah, and this larger than I, life thing. I, you know, yeah, I think that I think that it was he got a he got handed a a, a bad uh, a, he he took the, it was the brown acid right he he <laughs> he, uh, he shouldn't have, he shouldn't have had Kiss as his first like visual. No. That's right. too much because, because then he then Peter Frampton right after it it's like the difference between the headbangers and the hippies. Exactly. There's, yeah. there's not really a difference, but there is a difference oh, when you're yeah. talking about rock and roll, right? So absolutely. I mean, hippies like like heavy metal too, and and uh, you know Led Zeppelin is uh, you know one of the genesis of heavy metal. So when you think about it, Led Zeppelin's more hippie than they are headbanger, you know. So, yeah. but not to put anything in a box that that was during the time mid seventies. When you think, when you see these things standing next to each other, why are you drawn to Gene Simmons and Blackie Lawless a little bit more than Peter Frampton and Robert Plant? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, so, so here's one for you, Pat. My, my first concert was the plasmatics opening for kiss. So you talk about nothing adding up after that. You know? I think <laughs> I wanted to go to that show with my older <laughs> sister and my mom said, absolutely not. Fortunately, I think I was seven. Fortunately, <laughs> fortunately the gigs that came after were really good. Uh, the, yeah. I, I followed that with iron maiden Saxon and Fastway, and then Judas priest with great white. But I, I do know what you mean. If, you're, if your first gig or your first handful of gigs is something that's just larger than life and it's like a, a you know, it's like Star Wars and a comic book all in your face at the same time and it's like Perfect, perfect description. Yeah, you know perfect I mean? description. All of a sudden, uh, you know, some guys with an acoustic guitar sitting on a Persian rug just ain't going to cut. <laughs> Until you yeah. get much older and you learn to appreciate that sort of thing. But when you Exactly, kid, that's true. You're a kid. It's like, whoa, man, mind blown. They're all like this. And speaking man. of speaking of uh, acoustic on a Persian rug, I want to <laughs> talk about this <laughs> Heaven's Low covers album because I think in a video for uh, Like a Stone, Ooh. you're playing an acoustic so on good. a Persian rug. Yep. with some candles and shit. Yeah, but. You're nailing the shit out of it, dude. Me. Thank you. That one was daunting. It's daunting. That guy was too too amazingly talented. It's scary to have to sing stuff that like that. Making it, he's he made it look easy, and so he do did. You. Yeah, yeah. Well, guys so- like Chris Cornell. I'm going to compare you to Chris. A lot of great singers. I remember th- seeing you and Sebastian back in the day. I'm like, what is it with you guys where? You sing the mid tone and then you go to the high tone, but I never hear a break in your voice. Mm -hmm. And it took me years to unlock what it sounds like to transition with you guys with your high voice. I say you guys to the other voice. And it takes, it took me a long time to learn to do that. It's a, it's like switching, it's like learning how to drive a stick. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You have to figure out how to work the clutch. And and make it seem uh, seamless when you switch yes. gears. Took and me forever to learn that. Not not to get all techie on you, but and I'm not telling you anything you don't know. It's it's for for me because I feel like it's a little bit different. And being a, a coach or an instructor now, it's hard to to work with um, you know teenage uh, teenagers when they're learn when they're taking vocal lessons and explain what it is we're talking about to yeah. them because their voice is changing all the time. Yeah. You know, yeah. like they, they turn 13, their voice changes. They turn 15, 16, their voice changes again. Yeah. So they're, they're afraid they're going to lose octaves. And so the whole time I'm going, man, you just need to do sirens where you're just mowing over the break in your voice up and down all day long to yep. you, you figure out your application, how much air you need to use or not use when you find the break. 
Exactly. Yeah. And getting the tone was was tough. I re- used to record my vocals a lot before I was quote unquote a lead singer. I hated my vocals. I realized it was great that I hated my vocals because what I did is I recorded more and more, tried more and more, and kept reapproaching, reapproaching, reapproaching. And without sounding egotistical, I can pretty much turn that mic on and get what I want, generally speaking, if it's in my wheelhouse, pretty quickly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I wish my students could hear you say that because I tell them to record themselves all day long and it's the same thing. I don't like my voice up there. That's why you need to work on it. Yeah, I did that with guitar playing when I started guitar. I hated I hated what I sound like, so I kept doing it. Yeah, yeah, always work on what you're not good at. Exactly. Uh, I want to read off the uh, the running order of these freaking songs here. I got you, Nikki, John, and Chad. Um, additional Jesse Bilson, Cat Scarlet, Devin Lawrence, uh, Kirsten Rosenberg, Mary Whitman. These are all, we're just saying, I'm just saying their names so they can go, cool, my name's on TV kind of thing. <laughs> uh, Lucas Can- Canopa, Canopa. Uh, yep. Yeah, these are all just friends of yours in LA who do studio work or they're just friends in bands? So yeah, they're mostly people in bands. Some of them are the Iron Maidens. Stuff oh, right. like okay. that. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Real quick, this running order. We will rock you. Touch too much. I need to breathe. <laughs> we will rock you. Touch too much. Revolution is my name. Down in a hole. Uh, motor medley. Ain't no grave. Like a stone. Hungry for heaven. Crawling. Somebody put something in my drink. Desert plains. Oh, my God. Uh, don't change. Disc number two, Major Tom, Twilight Zone, Heartbreaker, Closer, Pull Me Under, Subdivisions, Out in the Cold, Losers and Winners. Nice. Is that accept? Yeah. Yep. Going to California, uh, Tonight We Need a Lover, Nothing Else Matters. So this is on one disc. I'll hold it up. This package is beautiful. It's a trifold, and it's got mock-up versions of members of Heaven Below uh, uh, doing the Highway to Hell photo shoot, the 2112 photo shoot. Um, I would say you should have had John be the naked dude. No, Shad has no – that would have been awesome. Shad <laughs> has no fat on his body, and he was so comfortable in the little G-string, we oh, figured that's fine. Him. Oh, that's That's Shad. our drummer. Oh, yeah. okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. You should have, I just I thought it would be funny to put John back there. Yeah, would have been funny. <laughs> would have been great. Um, anyway, um, you guys have great packaging. I am um, again. Uh, yeah, yeah again, again. You're always always thinking about that, yeah. and yeah. Um, that's always been impressive with you. This one, I have a sealed copy with, and I didn't want to open this because of my name's on the hype sticker. <laughs> had to be done well after we heard your vocals on the track we're like okay this is this is opening the album we were not going to open that album with your track but when you sent the track back we all got goosebumps and we're like we didn't even have to say it we just looked at each other and go that's how the album opens nice well thank you for that and yeah. do you do you remember you sent me like three different songs i don't recall which three i just chose nefarious angels because you said the the lyric uh hellacious acres yeah yes and that was my tribute like, to a great was, album and great band I was like why i was like why am i looking any further the lyric says <laughs> hellacious acres so everyone's going to get the joke so yeah. Um, so I unwrapped this one and kept the hype sticker on the cellophane, but, um, yeah, the package is amazing. Uh, too cool. There's a bit of a, is there a different lineup here? No, it's the same lineup. This is just well, pre Nikki. Yeah. Just, uh, Lucas has his own band that he went on to, to farm and Nikki came in to replace right. Lucas. Perfect. Yeah, I'm well, glad you brought that up, Jason, because there's some there's some amazing stuff on there. I, I told Patrick when he sent me the album, uh, I, I've never been much of a Linkin Park guy. And uh, that 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 version of that song you do crawling just I mean, dude, my hair stands up when I when I hear that. It's just so powerful. And you guys just nailed it. And then I, it, was, it was so good. I went back to listen to the original to see what have I been missing and uh there you know the lincoln park version was a little more uh hip-hop influenced or whatever and i think you guys sort of made it more rock and roll 
Uh, but your again, your vocals. I mean, I, I think one of the things that I really liked about the uh, Rest in Pieces record was the uh, was the vocal delivery. And you covered a, a wide range of very difficult singers. We've we've talked about Ronnie James Dio, Chris Cornell, Chester Bennington, Rob Halford. I mean, dude, that's 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 some big yeah, balls you're, you're doing there, you're man. You're borrowing. Yeah. You're 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 doing cover songs that are they're uh, they're actually paying tribute to your favorite guys, but you're giving them total justice. So. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Great job. I want to jump back to uh, this Heaven Below record that. I, I am lucky enough to be on a record, on, do some recordings, of course, with my friend Patrick Kinnison, who's our guest here on Talk Louder today. But um, you, how did you get, how that, well, it's obvious how you got lead on on the record, of course, duh. But, but the guy that I'm excited about being on a record with here, other than you, of course, like I said, is one of my heroes, Udo Dirk Snyder. How in the hell did you get Udo Dirk Snyder, who doesn't even live in America, as far as I know, on this record? It's a funny story. It's a quick story. And real quick, this record is called Good Morning Apocalypse. It's from 2016, just to be clear. You know, it's a yeah. few years ago, but not terrible. Yeah, below. Yeah. yeah. So my producer, my co-producer on the album, Jesse Bilson, was actually the guitar player in Heaven Below before that record. And he's gone on since to do all kinds of film and TV stuff, um, but he toured Europe with Udo Dirk Schneider in an all-star heavy metal tour that had Zach Wilde and people, all kinds of different people, and he was paired up with Udo Dirk Schneider, and when he told me that, I said, oh my God, that's one of my heroes, except is one of my favorite bands of all time, and so he would give me a play-by-play -play from Europe. He said, okay, yeah, I, I'm i playing this many except songs. Uh, Tonight I'm going down and I'm I'm gonna be uh, having dinner with Udo. And I was like, okay. Wow. And Jesse is another um, killer musician. I'm so blessed to have people like you guys in my life. Jesse is a killer musician. He doesn't act like it. He's a normal guy. And then you hear him play guitar. You hear him play piano or bass or drums. He's a multi instrumentalist. So we're very. He's very lucky like that. Um, he formed a friendship with Udo. And after the tour was done, he and Udo wrote a song together that ended up on one of Udo's uh, recent albums. Wow. Um, he had told Udo that we, or showed Udo that we had recorded Losers and Winners. He let him hear it. Udo gave it the thumbs up. And he just stayed in contact with him. I want to say Udo was living in Italy, but I can't remember after the tour they did. Uh, he said, Udo, I'm working on an album with my old band. It's a concept record. And they have a song called Black uh, Sunrise, War of the Gods. And it's very acceptish. And they would love to have you put a vocal on it if you're open to it. And if not, it's fine. He was able to ask Udo this because they were so close. Um, once again, another one of these moments. Jesse calls me and says, Udo liked the song he'd be happy to lend a vocal on it. I'm like, you're joking. And he said, no, I'm being serious. He'll, he'll record the vocal there in another country. Um, you, you just have to pay the engineer. That's all you got to do. I'm like, oh my God, are you serious? Sure enough, we give the engineer whatever his hourly rate was. The weekend went by and we got the track back and Udo had heard my vocal in my lyrics and he just did his own version of it and we told him do whatever it is you do uh and i heard it back and i the hairs on my body stood up and i almost got teary-eyed i was like udo dirk schneider just sang on a song that i wrote in this room once again is this my grandmother why is this happening why is udo singing on one of my songs and we got so excited about it we're like why are we stopping there? Why don't we have some other badass singers? Call Jason. I have the Lita Ford gig. Let's ask Lita. These, it just, yeah. is it timing? I don't know what it is. Yeah. Well, you know, you, I always say, uh, use your resources. Don't mm -hmm. be afraid to use your resources. Um, don't be afraid to call in, uh, not beg, but, you know, favors that you don't know till you say, hey, can you help me cross the street? You know, you don't you don't know. Uh, you don't know what people are going to say if there's something that sounds cool that you can 
kind of hook people together or yeah you know, i wonder if this riff works with this riff or, yeah you don't know until you try so yeah that's exactly how, that's how parts meet parts and turn into something uh incredibly life-changing for everybody so yeah and then we had we had four singers we had one last song that we wanted a, a cameo appearance we thought let's get somebody who's on the rise that has something going on and cobra page from cobra and the lotus uh our friend bones elias was on drums and i who's said from, i need one more from, female vocal from south texas south texas same thing uh, i said bones bones knew what was going on with udo and with you and lita for the album just because he's a friend and he was in the band for a while um he said i have the perfect female for the, the, the other female vocal you need i said who he said i play with this band cobra and the lotus i'm gonna play her a track tonight i was like wait wait what what hold on what he goes yeah let me play her a track let me let her choose a track and um i gave him a couple of tracks once again before i went to bed that night i'm talking to cobra Oh, I really like this one song. She hadn't even heard what you or Udo did, or Lita. She said, I really like this one song. I'd be happy to, to can you pay my engineer? I think that's the same thing as they ask. <laughs> Apparently, yeah. if you pay the engineer, anybody's going to sing on your album. <laughs> I, have some, I have something to show you. Um, this is, I have the machine that I recorded that vocal on. Oh shit! I can hold it up. I mean, it's as big as a library book. So this is what I recorded that vocal on. Wow! This, this thing right here. Probably an SM58 or something, huh? That's a, vocal mic. Yeah, yeah. Probably this mic here. Wow! Yeah. <laughs> so a 58 plugged straight into this guy, and I yep. recorded that vocal for Nefarious Angels. This is a a BR600, a Boss digital recorder. It's completely obsolete at this mm -hmm. point uh i use it for playback i can sample things and play them back like um when the when my students cover for those about to rock i have the canons on here when i nice. do uh uh you know uh for whom the bell tolls i have the bells on here you know recorded right off the vinyl probably all right on here so awesome anyway, pretty pretty fun little little stories there um we're talking to pat kennison who plays currently with lita ford and has his own band heaven below here on talk louder and this has been great pat i'm not trying to hurry our show to an ending but i'm sure me and dave could talk to you another you know half hour if we wanted to you doing fine oh man it's awesome yeah i mean this just this texas connection makes me feel empowered and just at home again <laughs> well, it's a hang, and we don't get to hang very often uh, just in the weird times uh, on top of the fact that you live, uh, you know, 2,000 miles away or whatever. So, um, you know, in the new, in the new uh, day and age from uh, growing up in the 70s and 80s and, and you guys more in the 80s probably, the, uh, you know, technology is uh, keeping us all together and, and – uh, you know, I think it's been great. Uh, being an old dog and having to learn how to do all this stuff is, has been interesting. For for Dave, too, just even, uh, you know, Jared calling me and Dave going, hey, we're going to do a podcast and with you and Dave. And I was like, man, bonus. Man. That sounds awesome. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you, I've learned more about USB ports in the last two months than I ever. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't even, this microphone, forget about it, man. I mean, yeah. these guys had to hook me up with this stuff because I was just, I'm just, totally lost when, when you think about i mean uh, i mean pat's the pro here but when you think about well how do i plug a guitar into the computer right <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you first think of like well let's see i plug into the marshall stack yeah and i put exactly. a microphone in front of the marshall stack and that goes through a pa or whatever yeah or an analog recorder there's all these just but how do you get it in here how do you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. How do I get my guitar to go in there? Right. I tell my girlfriend all the time. I, I she's a lot younger than us, and I tell her, I'm happy that I've lived to see this. I yeah. can't believe that I have this thing that weighs 16 pounds called a Kemper, and I'd rather play through that than my Marshall stack. What? How did this happen? This you is know? something that I was going to bring up. Is you have um. 
I, I, I'm, it was a lot more kicking and screaming uh, that I had to learn a new something new about how to do what I do. Yeah. Um, and I feel like you uh, grew up in a time where you were a bit, took it a little bit more gracefully and um, than I did. Uh, maybe just the, the, the little bit of age difference and uh, that since you're a guitar player and a singer and were involved in the production of your records uh, mm -hmm. early on, that you were able to figure out a lot of stuff and, and get your tone. And then eventually, you know, you got microphones and recording machines laying all over the place because of that. Well, I'm going to learn, I'm going to work on my vocals now. And it, it, anyway, there was no brick wall for you to hurdle uh, other than other than the ones that were the small-ish learning curves. And I feel like what Dave has just explained, like when we get this uh, podcast going, he's got to figure out how to get the square into the circle hole, yeah. <laughs> the square into the round yeah. hole. Dude, I am and, starting uh, and, from scratch big time. <laughs> well, the payoff is so huge with the gear. I mean, yeah, I, when I started recording, it, it just we were just getting off the analog reel to reel. It was still there. ADATs had come in, samplers, triggering the drums, stuff like that. But each time I was patient and learned something, probably like your boss thing, the payoff was always great. And and you know, the plugins. Okay, well, there's a plug-in. What what is this? Well, finally, the compressor and the little plug-in, when I dial it, wow, it's so easy now. Yeah. It always pays off to kind of give a little extra time and, and patience to the to the technology. You still have a stack of tube amps laying around? You know, I got rid of everything except for my first Marshall head that my mom got me. I have my Marshall head from 1987 that Michael Schenker played through, which is a, a great story on its own. It's sitting on top of my refrigerator. I profiled it into my fancy Kemper unit that weighs 16 pounds. Because <laughs> you can do that. USB. I can do that. <laughs> USB, right. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's USB now, Dave, as you know. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm, learning. I'm learning. I'm trying to catch up. I'm trying to catch up. But yeah, Jason's right. We could go on all night with, uh, with our buddy Patrick. We should probably move on to our shot of rock and roll. <laughs> Pat, I know that you're a huge Accept fan, and we talked a little bit about Accept during the episode today, but tell me what it is, that for, why they're so important to you, and talk to me a little bit, if you will, about some of their recent albums, because I know you've been a big champion of some of the later stuff as well. Yep, my Accept relate, my, my relationship with Accept goes back to Joe Anthony holding my little tape recorder in 1982 against the, my sister's home stereo. He played fast as a shark. I had never heard music with double bass that fast with the shredding and the zhug -a -dug -a -dug -a. I mean, Judas Priest was heavy. Sabbath was heavy. All that. Metallica hadn't hit yet for me. I, I didn't have anything like that. Fast as a shark. Heard it. Told my, my mom, what do you want for Christmas? I said, I don't care about Christmas. I just need Restless and Wild on LP. I got it. Um, huge Accept fan. Fast forward decades later, uh, they were going to do a reunion with a new singer, but they had already tried a new singer in the 80s that didn't really work, in my opinion. So uh, I the, laughed. The toys, I laughed. The, the Toys opened two shows in Colorado with Dave Reese on vocals. Wow. Yeah, toys and Accept. Yeah. Trippy. I was resilient. I was a little uh, resilient to the Dave Reese Accept because I was such an Udo fan. So when 2009, 10, whatever that was, they said they were going to do a reunion, I kind of scoffed at it. I thought, no Udo, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and then I heard they got Mark from TT Quick, and I knew Mark was a badass singer. I still didn't think it was going to be great until I heard the first single for off of Blood of the Nations. I think it was either The Abyss, maybe it was Beat the Bastards Down, I ate my words. I said, oh, my God, this is on par with Fast as a Shark and Balls to the Wall. This is real good. And I knew they had Andy Sneap at the helm producing, so I had a feeling that might. Anyway, I was blown away by it. And I said, wow, a band with a new singer decades later, not only living up to 
uh, the legendary of what they had had, maybe better at times, Kill Me Now, maybe better, uh, went and saw him, blown away by it. Um, the Kemper is the, is the reason, the Kemper was something I saw uh, Wolf Hoffman play, and he told, I said, that's the best guitar tone I've ever heard live. It's the Kemper. It's a German. It uh, take digital snapshot of the amplifier. And um, anyway, that and that's my accept thing with that. Now the guys know me, and when I roll up, they kind of roll their eyes. They're like, "Here comes the biggest accept fan ever." So I have to check myself. But they're, I think they're on their fifth or sixth album with Mark. And man, I don't know how they managed to make it sound so great and work, but. Uh, I'm playing with them at M3, so I'm definitely going to be side stage checking myself to make sure that I'm not too much of a fanboy. <laughs> <laughs> you don't wreck yourself, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you because I know you you're you're a huge Accept fan, and uh, you're one of those guys that's actually even championed the later stuff. And I and I know that you've you've even gone on record as saying. Uh, it's on par with some of the classic Udo stuff. And as you said just now, that some of it, in your opinion, uh, there's moments where it might even be, yeah, something that could have ended up on an album back in the 80s or whatever. So. Easily, easily great stuff. Not to take away from Udo because he is as legendary as Rob Halford or Paul Stanley or whoever. But wow, what a rare feat that that band could do that with with Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and uh, TT Quick was like uh, this sort of East Coast band that was in all of the heavy metal rags that you would buy or pick up or your friends had. I would see a full ad on uh, I can't remember the name of that their the record they were pushing all the time. The one with the fist and the lightning bolts. Yeah, make it bleed or yeah can't remember what it was called right now i think it bleeds probably co totally wrong but it sounds yeah. cool anyway uh i think that uh and that was right around the time when accept was blowing up that was mid 80s yeah. you know so yeah. it's uh yeah except is one of those bands that you know they it didn't wait isn't uh wolf the only original guy at the moment I think that that's where it is. And I have to tell myself, I can't let that deflect from the greatness that is accepted because they're still releasing great albums. Yeah. Yeah. I think they even do three guitar players now. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do have an accept story. Um, the toys were recording the debut record. I'm at the Sizzler. Mm -hmm. is the, they still have the Sizzler in LA. Cause dude, it was, this is late 80s. I'm sure I think there's one down the street from my house right here. I'm not joking. Still open? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. So anyway, I'm in line at the Sizzler, and it's Max Norman. It's, it's Max Norman and all the toys, and we're okay. standing in line at the Sizzler. So I was yeah. still in the car, and I came in late, and there was somebody, you know, it's like Scott and Mark and Mike, and then there's a, a couple, like a young couple standing behind you know max and scott and mark mike and mark or whatever so i'm behind this couple in line at the sizzler in los angeles 88 and oh my god i'm like can't help myself that the the, the young man in front of me it's george fisher wow and i recognize him because i'm a fan you know, you yeah. just see some guy in L.A. with tight pants on and big hair. Sure. He's like, well, whatever. No, it's not like he does. He's not in, you know, Motley Crue, you know, yeah. big hair, tight pants. It's like he's, he's, you know, he's casual, you know, like the guys in Accept kind of dressed a little bit casual sometimes. Yeah, kind of even street their, dressed. Even yeah. on their album covers and stuff. Yeah. Maybe leather pants instead of jeans, but yeah. whatever. So, you know, whatever. He's just wearing a T-shirt and jeans, and I'm, I'm like, and I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, I excuse me, and I could be totally wrong, but are you George Fisher from Accept? And he's like, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I just introduced myself. I'm like, just a huge fan. I know we're all about to eat. I just wanted to shake yeah. your hand and say I'm a huge fan. And, you know, because he's just a regular looking guy when you think about what George Fisher really yeah. looks, you know. So, yeah. but that's his. You know, and I have the same kind of story. It's a restaurant, and it's the and it's the guitar player from EZO. Oh wow! And I'm like going, dude, you're in EZO, and he's like, yeah. 
<laughs> yes, I am an easy O. That's very, it's a good boy you are. <laughs> I'm just a fan, right? I didn't have anything to tell either of them other than, yeah. oh my God, I'm not worthy kind of a moment. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I, I gave Udo Dirk Schneider a cassette. I saw Acceptance Saxon at the Austin City Coliseum in like 85. Wow. And, um, and I gave a, a cassette of me sing a watchtower, me singing Meltdown from the Cottage Cheese Lips, uh, from the Lips of Death, my first vinyl appearance on a cassette to him because I always tried to sound a little bit like Udo when I sang. Sure. And yeah. I handed him a cassette and he's like sitting at a table at an in store at the old Waterloo Records when it was a shoebox. Yeah. And he, uh, he took the cassette and he shook it like to make sure. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't a bomb or something, you know. <laughs> and uh, and he's like, he kind of shook his head, like, okay. And he put it in a in his uh his chest pocket on his jacket. And who wow. knows what happened after that? But I've, awesome. uh, I've been able to say I've shared the bill with Udo and Accept on festivals and things like that. But that's really all the Accept I have. Yeah, same same kind of thing. Um, I got uh the first Accept record I think I had was Breaker. Yeah. And then I got the first album and then I got restless. And by that yeah. time I was already covering songs off both of those with Watchtower, but nice ding dong. That's all I got for except what about <laughs> okay. you, Dave? Uh, I was much like Patrick. Uh, I heard fast as a shark courtesy of Joe and Anthony on the radio in San Antonio. And I was like, first, uh, you know, I remember the, the little nursery rhyme intro and I was like, what the hell is this? And yeah. then the needle scratches across the record and you hear one of the most ungodly blood curdling screams you've ever heard <laughs> in your life. And to this yeah. day, to this day, it still ranks up there with one of the, you know, and I was just, and then in comes the, the double pick and guitars and the kick drums. Ah. And it's just, uh. like, Oh my God, it was a whole yeah. new level of heavy. Yeah. Um, and then of course I went on to see him numerous times. Um, I actually uh, did an interview with Udo one time in downtown Austin. I was on his tour bus and he was touring as, as Udo and I'm on his bus and we're rolling tape and I'm doing an interview and he's, I have him sign my uh, vinyl copy of restless and wild that I've had since high school. He signed my vinyl copy of breaker that I've had since high school. And I was thrilled. And I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever seen his autograph, it's this huge, big swirl, you know, so yeah. it kind of takes up, you know, the entire album cover, and it was awesome. I was so proud to have that. Years later, uh, except is coming back through town uh, with uh, the the TT Quick guy Mark, and yeah. uh, the the band at the time was had Wolf Hoffman, Stephen uh, Peter Baltas, and uh, and I think it was George Fisher was making was back in the band for a minute. Uh, or was it Herman Frank? I think it was. It George. was probably Herman Frank. It might have been Herman yeah. Frank. Yeah. So I take the record, the the ones that Udo signed. So mind you, these are classic Accept albums that I've had since high school. They're vinyl. They've got Udo Dirk Schneider. They are pristine, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking I'm going to take them to this gig, and I'm going to get the other guys to sign them and uh, and almost complete the lineup a little bit. Well, I get to the gig and uh, the guys sign them, but they had this uh, different drummer, uh, Stefan Schwartzman, I believe. Yep. Yep. And uh, the guys start signing and they, they just sort of pass it to the next guy and Schwartzman starts signing. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. He's not on that album. I know. I'm like, I'm one of these dorks, you know, it's like I only want the guys that played on the album to sign the album. Come on, man. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I was too late to intercept them. And, um, and then, and then of course the, the guy, Peter and, uh, Herman and, um, and Wolf, Wolf. Yeah. the Sharpie started, you started running out of ink on those guys. Uh, well, friggin' Schwartzman has this silver paint pan that is oh, no. brand new, dude. So it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So he signs his, he's got the best looking autograph on the whole, on both albums and he doesn't play on either one of them. I was mortified, man. And to this day, they're, they're hanging up in my office here framed. And I just wish that if there was ever a time, I wish I just left the damn albums at home and 
<laughs> you know, it just had Udo's signature on it. That's that's one of these things I call autographs gone wrong, man. It was, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the reason we have this show is because a lot people of people would not give a shit. You know, it's like uh, or Tommy would, Thayer. Or wouldn't know. Tommy, Tommy Thayer could sign Ace Freely and some dumb fucks wouldn't give a shit. Yeah, they, right? yeah exactly. But yeah, I, I, so my, my accept records are like, I should have left them home. They were so cool when they just had Udo's uh, autograph on them. But Well, it, it, at least is the drummer's name was Stefan because the or old, the old guy is Stefan Kaufman. Kaufman, yeah. yeah at least yeah. it was Stefan. So. Yeah, but yeah. I'm telling you, man, that, that silver uh, Sharpie was out for blood, dude. I mean, that thing was relentless. And 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 Herman and Peter are signing with this black Sharpie that's like running yeah. out of ink. And it's like, Jesus, man. So, yeah, that's my yeah, The lesson here is don't show up with one Sharpie. Yeah. Well, I didn't show up with the silver one. He already had it. But- <laughs> He was no, ready to I, go. I realize that, but but you you need to make sure you have two, and just in case yeah. one fucks up. Yeah. yeah. No, I I'm a, I'm I've gotten pretty good about that over the years, and th- and this was recently, so this is all totally on me. This is my bad. I'm I'm I have no shame in jumping in front of somebody and go wait wait hey man, hey yeah. dude, no disrespect. And I would like to think that if you're a musician, a professional musician, I mean Patrick wouldn't sign a Runaways album. At no, a- of course not. You know what of I mean? Of course not. Right. So, yeah. So it's one of those things, but <laughs> so that's a, that, these are just professional nerd isms. Yeah. yeah. Like there's a lot of people that show up with, you know, stacks of stuff to sign and you know what? I'll sign all of it if they want me to. Yeah. Unless I'm not on it. Right. Right. Oh, if I'm not on it, I don't, I mean, they're not handing me a dirty looks cover to right. sign. Just yeah. because Paul is in Dangerous Toys, it's right. The same, exactly. That's the same argument. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, listen, man, this has been a blast. I don't think we should keep Patrick any longer. Uh, I just wanted to thank you, man, for joining us for being our very first uh, guest on the Talk Louder podcast. Uh, before we let you go, real quick, uh, tell people where they can keep up with you, your social media, your Facebook, whatever it is you want to, what, whatever it is you want to share as far as contact information. Yeah, I'm easy to find. If you go to Lita's site, LitaFordOfficial.com, I'm on there. If you go to HeavenBelow.com, that's my band. That's the central hub. Of course, we're on the Instagram, the Patrick Kennison. Of course, we're on Facebook. It's all pretty easy to find. And um, yeah, we, we're pretty active, man. We don't we don't stay behind me personally and the rest of the band people I play with. We don't hide behind anything. We pretty much stay up front with everything with everybody and. You know, I love the humor. I love the jokes. I love I love everything that we talk about on this show, and I love doing that on social media. It's 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 definitely the lifeblood with this uh, lockdown. This kind of stuff, like your show, you, know, you guys' show, keeps people going. You know. Yeah, yeah. and I think, uh, I think the lockdown has spawned a lot of the sort of continuity to where there were gaps, and yep. now it's still going to be continuity, no gaps at mm-hmm. all because. You know, we could do this show forever. There's plenty of things, people to talk to, things to talk about. Um, Yeah. So what about the fake accounts where people are saying that they're you? Man, I don't even consider myself even even a a fractional percentage compared to what other people who are real rock stars get. But it's frustrating. It's so frustrating. Yeah, well, people trying to benefit financially or otherwise with um, through Rockstar's accounts. I know the guys, not just you, but the other guys in the toys have dealt with it. I remember when Facebook started, girls approached me on Facebook and said, do you have the pictures I sent you? I said, what pictures you sent me? They said from their other account uh, on this Friendster or whatever. And somebody had taken a picture of me and said, I'm the guitar player for Union Underground and got girls pictures. And I was like, well, that sucks because I never saw the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> well, that tells you a lot about the person that went to all of the effing trouble just to do that. It tells you a lot yeah. about how how low they are. Yeah. So and people usually I think it's money like Lita gets it weekly uh, and people trying to look like a famous rock star asking for money 
why, whether it was Paul Stanley or Jason McMaster, why would any of us ask for money like that? We would we would direct people to our merchandise or our music. Yeah, yeah. It's a weird thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, just wanted to bring that up. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're uh, happy to hear you got some dates on the calendar with Leah, and uh, I hope that touring in general gets uh, up and rolling again, because we all miss live music, and uh, we miss doing some of this face-to-face -face at gigs, you know, like we're doing here on the podcast. So uh, we wish you luck in uh, putting that itinerary together and having some great shows and getting back on stage, and uh, give our best to Nikki and uh, everyone in your band. A, a special shout to uh, John Younger, who is a huge... Uh, listener fan of the podcast we appreciate him so much he sent me a a wonderful email that i shared with jason and jared and uh his enthusiasm just came through the email and we love that stuff we live for he's it. a fan just like all of us yeah yep. so our, our best to him and everyone in your in your circle there pat and uh thanks for joining us tonight and uh who knows maybe we'll do it again sometime i'm always here for you guys i love my texas my texas connection thanks yeah. brother thanks brother Thanks, Pat. And thank you, everyone, for listening to another episode of the Talk Louder podcast.